Rise and shine, Mr. Freeman. Rise and shine. Half-Life Alex is almost here, and no series is more deserving of a new game. Not that I wish to imply that this is Half-Life 3. It's actually a new VR adventure set before Half-Life 2. With that in mind, we figured we'd get you caught up to speed with half life story as we know it. So wake up, Mr. Freeman. Wake up and smell the Half-Life timeline. And subscribe to the leaderboard. The first Half-Life just told the story of a scientist who was having a really bad day. Since then, newer titles from Valve and Gearbox rewrote bits and pieces of the story. But despite the retcons throughout the years, the core structure of the Half-Life plot remains the same. Half-Life and the Black Mesa Incident. It's the year 2000 and something. Seriously, Valve hasn't officially confirmed a specific year, so we only know it happens sometime in the 2000s. We follow Gordon Freeman, a theoretical physicist working at Black Mesa Research Facility. As Gordon takes the tram to his laboratory, he passes by a security guard banging on a door. His name is Barney Calhoun, but we'll get back to him in a bit. Gordon arrives in the Anomalous Materials Laboratory, his workplace within Black Mesa, and slips into his HEV suit. That's short for Hazardous Environment Suit. Think of it as a protective exoskeleton. As long as Gordon's wearing that thing, he's more protected from radiation, physical trauma, and other miscellaneous dangerous energy discharges. After Gordon suits up, two scientists named Gina Cross and Colette Green hand him a test sample labeled GG3883. Gordon loads the sample into the anti-mass spectrometer, but unfortunately, no one has any clue that this thing is actually a Zen crystal. Sure enough, the spectrometer goes berserk and briefly sends Gordon to an alien planet called Zen. When he returns to Earth, he finds the test chamber absolutely destroyed, and the fabric of the space-time continuum torn apart. Placing the Zen crystal into the spectrometer caused a resonance cascade, opening a portal to Zen and putting the entire Earth at risk. Creatures from Zen, like head crabs and vortigons, start pouring into Black Mesa, causing widespread panic. Years later, this event would come to be known as the start of the Black Mesa Incident. Future Half-Life games shed some light on a few side stories that happen alongside Gordon's journey. Barney, the security guard from earlier, stars in his own adventure called Half-Life Blue Shift. Essentially, while Gordon's doing his thing, Barney runs around Black Mesa and Zen, protecting some survivors and escorting them to safety. Meanwhile, Gina and Colette have their own story in Half-Life Decay, but we'll check in on them later. For now, let's focus on Gordon's perspective. He has to fight through Black Mesa, hoping to get back to the surface and find some help. Unfortunately, it's it's not just aliens that he needs to worry about. A human military force called the Hazardous Environment Combat Unit storms the facility. They're not just there to kill the aliens. To cover up the whole story, they're out to kill everyone, even the scientists. Meanwhile, the Resonance Cascade is still in full force, and Gordon joins up with the Lambda team. They're an internal group of scientists in Black Mesa who might know how to stop it. They ask him to launch a rocket in the facility, which houses a satellite. With that satellite orbiting around the Earth, they can use it to reverse the cascade. Gordon pulls that off no problem, then he runs into some Black Ops assassins, who are also here to kill everyone, including the HECU soldiers. That's right, there are layers upon layers of conspiracy going on here. In fact, in Half-Life Opposing Forces, we even learn that the Black Ops team is trying to set off a nuclear bomb to completely level everything in and around Black Mesa. In all the confusion, Gordon gets captured by some HECU soldiers. They strip him of all his weapons and throw him into the trash compactor, leaving him practically defenseless. Luckily, they left him with his deadliest, most reliable weapon of all, his trusty crowbar. And so, Gordon fights his way through the underground secret areas of Black Mesa. Along the way, he learns that his fellow scientists have known about Zen for a while now, and have been gathering all sorts of alien specimens for research. By the time Gordon reaches the surface, a full-blown war has broken out between the human marines and the various aliens from Zen. Meanwhile, Gina Cross and Colette Green have been working in the background to mitigate the destructive effects of this resonance cascade. Nice to see they're doing their part, since, you know, they're the ones who gave Gordon that Zen crystal in the first place. They end up successfully pulling off a resonance reversal, weakening the cascade, but not ending it entirely. Gordon travels across a war-torn Black Mesa until he finally reaches the Lambda Complex. That's where Gordon's colleagues have been developing transportation technology for their secret trips to Zen. He learns that the satellite he launched earlier didn't work, because a powerful force in Zen is keeping the portal open. To stop the resonance cascade once and for all, Gordon needs to travel to Zen and stop whatever that is. So, he uses the teleporter in the Lambda Complex to get there. Now, in an alien world, Gordon travels across Zen, slaying all sorts of terrifying creatures, including the Gonark. This thing puts up one of the biggest fights in Zen, second only to the final big bad boss of Half-Life, Nihilanth. Gordon takes one last teleporter to reach this giant floating 
baby with an exposed brain. Whatever it is, it's it's very creepy. And after Gordon takes it down, the Nihilanth explodes in a bright green light that engulfs Gordon. When Gordon comes to, he awakens face to face with G-Man. If you're wondering who the G-Man is, well, so am I. No one really knows who or what this guy is. All we know is that he's a mysterious agent who watches over everything, only occasionally stepping in to nudge events in the direction he pleases. G-Man says that Gordon performed well, and he cryptically offers Gordon a job. Gordon accepts, steps through a portal, and then finds himself floating in nothingness. See, G-Man has placed our hero in stasis, where he'll remain for the foreseeable future. Gordon's story is on hold for now, but Half-Life Opposing Forces shed some light on the fate of Black Mesa. A thermonuclear device effectively wiped it off the face of the Earth. It's the same one the Black Ops group tried to set off, but the G-Man is the one ultimately responsible for blowing the place up. The Seven Hour War. After the resonance cascade from the Black Mesa incident, portal storms start appearing all over Earth. These storms would negate gravity wherever they went, ravaging the land while connecting Earth to Zen. All sorts of creatures travel from Zen to Earth, making it harder for humans to survive. Even worse, a brand new threat shows up, the Combine. The Combine is an almighty interdimensional organization that conquers planets and absorbs them into its massive empire. No one exactly knows the full extent of the Combine's might, but no one would want to test it either. Using the portal storms, they travel directly to Earth, and their military force quickly subdue all of humanity in just seven hours. Dr. Wallace Breen, the former top dog at Black Mesa, negotiates humanity's surrender to the Combine, bringing the Seven Hour War to an end. Breen becomes the de facto leader of humanity, and now reports directly to his Combine superiors. The Combine then installs a suppression field to inhibit human reproduction, fully cementing their control on Earth. Half-Life 2. Then, about two decades later, Gordon Freeman wakes up. The G-Man decides to wake him up now, figuring it was a good time to let us in on the Half-Life story. Gordon's on a train in City 17, located somewhere in Eastern Europe. When he exits the train, he finds armed patrols called Civil Protection have occupied the station. One of these officers stops Freeman and pulls him aside. Things are looking bad, but luckily, he's actually Barney Calhoun, the former security guard from Black Mesa before the incident. Barney works for the Resistance, a group that lives to fight against the Combine. After Gordon gets caught up to speed, he starts making his way to Dr. Isaac Kleiner's lab to regroup with the resistance. Kleiner used to work at Black Mesa and was Freeman's mentor during his time at MIT. On the way, Gordon gets into a tense situation with civil protection. He almost gets captured, but at the last moment, a young woman named Alex Vance saves him. That's Alex with a Y, like Half-Life Alex. The new game that presumably fits into the timeline sometime before Gordon wakes up in City 17. With Alex's help, Gordon heads to Kleiner's lab where he reunites with Eli Vance, and more importantly, his HEV suit. Eli is a former researcher from Black Mesa and Alex's father. For the next step in their adventure, Kleiner plans to teleport Gordon and Alex to Black Mesa East to meet with the scientist working there. The teleporter sends Alex there without a hitch, but as it's sending Gordon there, Eli's pet headcrab Lamar messes with the teleporter. The interference teleports Gordon back and forth and directly inside Breen's office. As you can imagine, this puts the Combine on high alert. When Gordon ends up just outside Kleiner's window, Kleiner shuts the teleporter down. From there, Gordon has to run on foot through the city's canal system to regroup with Alex, all while being chased by Silver protection. Once Gordon finds an airboat, he makes his way through the canals and gets to Black Mesa East. Here, he meets Dr. Judith Mosman and reunites with Alex and Eli. He also gets a hold of the Zero Point Energy Field Manipulator, aka the Gravity Gun. Alex also introduces Gordon to a giant, deadly robot that runs like a dog, rolls around like a dog, and likes being pet like a dog. Its name is Dog. While Gordon and Alex are playing with Dog, some Combine troopers break up the party, launching a full-scale assault on Black Mesa East. As Gordon, Alex, and Dog try to meet up with the others inside, Gordon Gordon and Dog get separated by some collapsed debris. Dog opens a pathway for Freeman to get to Ravenholm, where he can escape from the Combine attack. However, what he finds is a long deserted town now full of headcrabs and zombies. Nonetheless, Gordon perseveres and returns to safety, only to discover that the Combine has taken Eli and they're holding him prisoner up in Nova Prospect. Every second counts, so Gordon takes Highway 17 and makes a beeline towards Nova Prospect. Along the way, he fights off Combine forces and antlions, which are as terrifying as their name makes them sound. Eventually, Gordon reunites with Alex at the Nova Prospect train depot. Together, they head to the prison where Eli is being kept, find him there along with Mossman. Just then, Mossman reveals that she's actually a Combine spy and teleports herself, along with Eli, to the Citadel, a fortress within City 17. Gordon and Alex then use the same teleporter to reunite with Kleiner so they can figure out their next move. However, just as they leave, the teleporter in Nova Prospect explodes, destroying the area and keeping Gordon and Alex from immediately reaching Kleiner's lab. Instead of directly teleporting there, they 
they get stuck in time for more than a week. The Resistance sees the destruction of Nova Prospect as a sign. So while Gordon and Alex are stuck in time limbo, the Resistance takes to the streets in an all-out war against the Combine. Once Gordon finally rematerializes, he takes up arms and joins the battle, making his way across City 17 to reach the Citadel and save Eli. He loses all his weapons when he gets to the Citadel, but it's no big deal. His gravity gun gets supercharged, so it's hard to complain. Gordon enters a pod to travel through the fortress, and it ultimately ends up in Breen's office. Mossman and Breen are both there, and are holding Alex and Eli prisoner. Mossman betrays Breen at the last minute, forcing him to use the gravity gun to protect himself, and allowing our heroes to escape captivity. Alex and Gordon, with gravity gun in tow, chase down Breen. The pair reach the Citadel's dark energy reactor, and Breen opens a portal to the Combine overworld. Together, Alex and Gordon destroy the reactor, but it causes a gigantic explosion. Right before the shockwave hits Gordon and Alex, time freezes, and a sense of deja vu sets in. The G-Man appears once again, putting Gordon back in stasis as the credits roll. However, this isn't the end of Gordon's story. There's still much more to come. Half-Life 2 Episode 1 After the explosive end of Half-Life 2, Val followed up with a sequel, sort of. Think of Half-Life 2 Episode 1 as more of an expansion. Episode 1 starts off right where Half-Life 2 left off, with time frozen mid-explosion. Things happen a little differently this time around, though. Some Vortigaunts, covered in purple glow, come in and disappear with Alex. When Gordon killed Nihilanth nearly two decades ago, he set the Vortigaunts free of its control, and they allied themselves with humanity and the Resistance. When the G-Man shows up to presumably put Gordon back in stasis, more Vortigaunts appear to shield our hero from the mysterious figure. Suddenly, we see Dog pulling rubble off of Gordon. He awakens outside of the Citadel, and Alex happily greets him. She lets Eli and Kleiner know that Gordon's alright, but they have some bad news. The dark reactor in the Citadel is about to blow, and when it does, it'll take them out along with everyone in City 17. So, Alex and Gordon dive into the heart of the fortress and slow down the core's meltdown process, effectively buying themselves and everyone in City 17 enough time to evacuate. Along the way, Alex learns that the Combine had actually set this reactor to blow up on purpose. They wanted to use the energy of the explosion to send an off-world message to get reinforcements, and City 17 would just be collateral damage. Gordon and Alex also find a video message from Dr. Mossman, who mentions that she's found something huge. But before she can tell our heroes, though, the video is cut short. Alex makes a copy of the message, bundling it into a data packet, and she and Gordon board a train to escape the Citadel. Unfortunately, this train is packed with sleeping stalkers. These things used to be human until the Combine experimented on them and turned them into monsters. Of course, nothing goes right here. The train gets derailed, waking up the stalkers and leaving our heroes without transportation. They have to trek through the ruined underground of City 17, fighting antlions and zombified Combine soldiers, aka Zombines, to survive. When they finally escape the underground, they travel through the infested streets until they reunite with Barney. He has some other survivors with him, so they all hatch an escape plan to get the survivors to safety. Gordon and Alex use themselves as bait to distract a majority of the Combine forces, while Barney and the survivors get on a train and leave City 17. Not long after, Gordon and Alex find a train on their own and take it to escape the city. As the train gets further from City 17, Gordon sees the reactor getting ready to blow. Some Combine pods escape the city before it explodes, but nonetheless, City 17 gets enveloped by a colossal explosion. The shockwave slowly expands, and as it reaches Gordon, the screen fades to white. Half-Life 2, Episode 2. So yeah, instead of a Half-Life sequel, it's expansion got a sequel. Anything to avoid the number three, right Valve? Anyway, Episode 2 opens with Gordon waking up in a wrecked train, after the shockwave destroyed City 17. The train's cars are collapsing, Gordon gets trapped inside a train car, but Alex pulls him out of the wreckage using the gravity gun. The destruction of City 17 resulted in a super portal forming above the city ruins, and portal storms have started going wild once more. One opens the path for Alex and Gordon to journey into a nearby mineshaft, which they explore. Alex informs Gordon that she needs to deliver the data packet she stole from the terminal to a local resistance group. Once it's in their hands, they'll be able to decode it and find out whatever Mossman was trying to say. Gordon and Alex reach a communication terminal, and they use it to contact the resistance base, where Eli and Kleiner are now based in. They all plan to meet in the White Forest base, and the resistance leader, Arn Magnuson, demands they arrive with the data packet intact. Unfortunately, the Combine cuts their conversation short by sending some hunters after them. One of these giant, deadly, bug-like robots ends up nearly killing Alex by stabbing her directly through the torso. Luckily, a Vortigaunt shows up just in the nick of time to stave off the hunter and stabilize Alex's condition. She's still unconscious and on the verge of death, though, so the Vortigaunt takes Alex to a nearby resistance outpost in the mines. Gordon catches up with them and meets with some other resistance members in the outpost while the Vortigaunt watches over Alex. Some more Vortigaunts show up to heal her, but they need a certain extract from the antlions to fully restore her health. Of course, Gordon and some other outpost members grab the extract for them. While the Vortigaunts work on Alex, the ever-mysterious G-Man appears and tells Gordon that he had previously saved Alex's life during the Black Mesa incident two decades ago. Apparently, Alex plays a vital role in whatever G-Man had planned, and he asks her to relay a message to her father, prepare for unforeseen circumstances. Alex finally 
awakens fully recovered, and she's ready for the next leg in their journey. She and Gordon head towards the next outpost and catch a ride. The Combine are also on their way to the White Forest Resistance Base, so a muscle car is just what our heroes need to make up for the lost ground. Pushing forward, Alex and Gordon have to make a few more pit stops. They spend some time in another outpost along the way to get their vehicle repaired, all while fighting off various Combine forces. Eventually, Gordon and Alex arrive at the White Forest Base, picking up Dog along the way. There, they find Eli and Kleiner, making this one big happy reunion. But they don't have too much time to celebrate, they still need to shut down the super portal. The Resistance plans to launch a rocket into space that can interfere with the satellite Gordon launched two decades ago during the Black Mesa incident. With the information in Alex's data packet, these devices should be able to shut down the super portal. While Kleiner and Eli decode the data Alex stole from the Citadel, the Combine launch an attack on the base, which Gordon helps defend. After they all regroup, they uncover that Dr. Mossman was talking about Borealis, an aperture science ship that contains mysterious, powerful research projects. Dr. Mossman knows how to find it, but the Combine are close to catching her, so Gordon and Alex set out to save her before the Combine can find out what she knows. Alex then delivers G-Man's message to Eli, prepare for unforeseen consequences. This shakes Eli to his core, and he confides in Gordon that G-Man said the same thing to him just before the Black Mesa incident all those years ago. The Combine then launches another, larger assault near the base, which Gordon again has to deal with. After securing the base, he meets with everyone and finally launches the rocket. Eli, Alex, and Gordon head outside to watch the rocket fly into space and close the super portal, but just before stepping out, Eli stops Gordon. He warns him to never, under any circumstance, use Borealis. He believes G-Man's message refers to the Borealis, and he asks Gordon to promise to destroy it. He also expresses how proud he is of everything that Gordon has done. After the super portal closes, Alex and Gordon prepare for their trip to search for Dr. Mossman, but then the unthinkable happens. Some Combine advisors show up and attack. They're the creatures behind the Combine's entire occupation of Earth, and they might even run the entire Combine Empire. One of them telepathically pins Gordon and Alex up against a wall, while another has Eli in its clutches. With his last few breaths, Eli beckons his daughter not to look. Then, the advisor sticks a tentacle-like appendage into Eli's head, ending his life. Just before Alex suffers the same fate, Dog comes to the rescue, damaging the advisor and forcing them to retreat. Alex weeps over her father's body, and the screen fades to black. And that's how it ends. That's right, Half-Life officially ends on a gut-wrenching cliffhanger. It's no wonder why everyone's been desperate for Half-Life 3. Instead, we'll just have to be content with Half-Life writer Mark Laidlaw's description of an episode 3 that never was. And Half-Life Alex, of course. Anyway, I've been Marcus with the leaderboard. We're 1 million players and counting, so if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, and let us know your predictions for Half-Life Alex. Thanks for watching.